Hey, Chris with RC Worst here. Welcome back to another great video. Today we're going to be taking you through some tips for all of you pump control box owners. So we're going to be specifically talking about some tips to help save you money and uh, ensure that your control box is doing everything for you that it can. So stay tuned and we'll jump right into things. All right, so tip number one involves a felt tip marker, and if you've watched our videos previously, some of these tips might have been repeated in some of the other videos, but since they're scattered out uh, and not everybody watches every video, we figured we'd consolidate them. So back again to the felt tip pen. Uh, it's very handy to use a marker to write down useful and relevant information either inside of your control box or on the front of the control box. It really doesn't matter. Um, obviously, if the control box is outdoors, writing on the exterior of the box is likely uh, going to wear away with time but if it's indoors you know it's going to stay put for quite a long time so you can put information I would highly recommend putting amperage information so when you install new equipment it's generally best practice to take a reading of the voltage take a reading of the amperage and then you want to write those down inside the control box that way if anybody comes out to the field or comes out to your box at any point in the future and quickly can compare those with what readings you're getting should you have a problem. In addition to uh, the amperage and voltage, you could write warranty expiration dates. It's recommended that you write uh, pump model numbers. That way you know what equipment is in the, in the septic tank or in the uh, sump or wet well, etc. Uh, the main reason being is this equipment oftentimes lasts five to ten years if everything's designed and installed properly. And most people's memory can't uh, or doesn't work that well over that period of time when you're looking at model numbers. So, just having it written down makes it super quick and easy. You can pop onto our website, punch in the model number, get the new pump ordered long before you have the plumber come out or someone come out and replace that pump for you or you do it yourself. All right, so tip number two involves all of the documentation and paperwork surrounding your system. And I know this video is specific to control box tips and the reason I've related it is because if it's an indoor installation, I'll actually like to put all of my documents or at least a copy of all my documents in a Ziploc bag, like a gallon bag, and just stick it to the wall right next to, above, uh, below, whatever, my control box. That way it's got everything that I purchased, installation manuals, receipts, how much I paid, who I bought it from. All of this stuff is going to be extremely in invaluable. Basically, if you're needing to process a warranty, you're going to need your receipt. If you're needing to order replacement equipment, you're going to want to know what you have. And if you didn't write it in there, uh, then you want to have a documentation to support what it is that you need to get ordered preemptively. You can definitely save yourself two service trips by having the equipment on site for the installer uh, ready to go. So essentially, keeping records of all of your documents, permits, etc., everything is a form of saving money or almost putting money away because those documents are going to save you time, they're going to save time for people who are doing work for you to fix and repair the system. They aren't going to have to do all this research themselves, and so that's putting money right back in your pocket. All right, so here we are with tip number three. This involves our HOA or MOA uh, switch, as they're commonly referred to. So you're going to see a hand off auto or a, uh, like we've got here, auto off hand, or you're going to see a manual off auto. What that hand or manual means is that you can bypass the controls inside of here and essentially turn the pump on directly. Now, if you're having a controls issue with a float switch or something along those lines, oftentimes if you flip the switch down into the hand position, if you're experiencing a high water alarm, you can actually pump the liquid level in the system down to clear that alarm. That way you've got time between the alarm going off and, another ser or, and a service technician coming out to take a look at the system or if you plan to work on the system yourself, it's always a lot nicer to work on a system that's not all the way full to the tippy top with sewage if you need to get in there, pull out the pump, check the floats, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you are in the case where the hand or the manual switch does not lower the liquid level, it's recommended to just go ahead and leave the system off until somebody's able to come out and take a look at it. I would say the biggest money saving portion of the MOA HOA switch is that it can essentially buy you time 
to get the service technician out, as I mentioned, and avoid that emergency call. Because oftentimes companies that offer 24 seven emergency service, even including ourselves, will kind of charge a premium rate for those after hours services. So ideally you wanna schedule all of your work during normal working business hours, and you can save a significant amount of money doing it that way. So take a stab at it, see if it's gonna fix the problem or not. Um, and if it does, you might end up saving yourself some money. All right, so here we are with tip number four. This is gonna involve just a simple visual inspection. Now, a visual inspection doesn't require any special skills or uh, anything like that, so this should be something that almost anybody can perform on their own system. Uh, simply pop the box open and take a look. What you're looking for is, uh, is everything look like it's hooked up the way that it should be? Uh, do we have any significant amount of debris, corrosion, uh, potentially some bugs or little critters, even rodents sometimes can get into these control boxes and step across a couple terminals and, and pop a breaker that way. Um, so if you're experiencing problems with your system, having a look inside the control box could potentially give you some sense of direction of where the problem lies. If you open it up and your contactors melted or uh, your wires are melted or something along that line, it's gonna really paint a much clearer picture. So when you're giving a call to a technician, you can tell them what you're seeing. And again, you're gonna save money because they're gonna spend less time coming out to your site taking a look at the control panel, determining what the problem was, going back, getting materials, and then coming back again. Um, so you can save a lot of money, and or if it's simple stuff, and if it's stuff that you're comfortable with fixing, it's pretty easy to find part numbers on all this stuff, order the parts, and replace and repair it yourself, should you be capable and confident in doing so. All right, so here we are with tip number five. Tip number five kind of relates to tip number four in that if you do find a bunch of debris, dust, rust, bugs, whatever inside of your control panel, um, it's recommended that if you do attempt to clean that, that you just simply use a shop vac with a relatively small nozzle so that you can get into the nooks and crannies as best you can. Uh, blowing air into a control panel could potentially cause that debris or dust or whatever to get lodged in smaller parts or components where it could cause a bigger issue than just simply using a vacuum to try to suck it out. Additionally, obviously a vacuum hose is typically plastic, so your safety factor is very high if you've got the breaker off and you go in there with the vacuum and, and go ahead and gently clean things up. That's usually your best approach for going ahead and cleaning things up. On top of that, if you do find you've got a bunch of stuff getting into your panel, try to figure out where it's coming from and take some corrective action to eliminate or solve the problem. Try as best you can to prevent that because obviously you're gonna be adding life to your system by protecting it from uh, outside contaminants, so to speak. So tip number six relates to installation of pump control panels as well as variable frequency drives. Uh, when you're installing pump control panels with a contactor or when you're installing variable frequency drives, you've gotta understand that these boxes can be noisy. So contactors typically will just, they make a thud sound when this, uh, when this slams in. It's a magnetic contactor and it slams in. I mean, that's quite loud. Now, what, what my point is here and what this tip involves is you want to avoid mounting these style control boxes as well, as well as variable frequency drives on living walls or opposite living walls. So if you can imagine uh, having a septic tank or a septic pump control box um, mounted right outside your bedroom wall and at the, in the middle of the night you get up, somebody flushes the toilet and this Th is thudding right above your head. That's gonna be quite a nuisance. Variable frequency drives don't necessarily thud, but they do make a kind of a high-pitched whine. So uh, in order to keep the person who's living there happy, uh, try to avoid installing these types of boxes opposite of living walls and everything should be great. All right, here we are with tip number six. Tip number six in involves your alarm, that uh, very loud noise that maybe your com neighbor is complaining about or maybe is uh, causing you some sleepless nights. Uh, if you've ever had a sewer alarm go off, you know they are quite loud. And obviously that's the point. They, you need to know that there's an issue to avoid a potential environmental spill or uh, 
even worse, backed up basement. Well, arguably worse, at least for you uh, today. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so in this panel, this is an Orenco S2 panel, and most panels, it's really easy to find the uh, speaker because the speaker is always gonna protrude from the box. So you can see this right here. I've never seen a speaker that didn't look almost identical to that one. And so that speaker is the noisy little bugger that's making your life rough. Um, and what you can do is if you turn off the breaker to the system, then you can go ahead and disconnect one of the two leads that's po providing power to the speaker and it'll shut up. And that's just kind of a nice tip because oftentimes these uh, control panels nowadays will have like an automatic period of time that you know you can push this button to silence it to put the button on the front here to silence it but usually it's going to automatically reset after a certain number of hours or a period of time and so you're constantly having to mess with it so to avoid that just pull that off and the red light in most cases depending on how it's wired is still going to be flashing so you know you've still got something to be concerned about but you're not getting that nuisance noise bugging everybody making everybody mad um, and as long as you do that with the breaker shut off, uh, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. The big thing with doing that is don't forget to hook it back up because next time something goes wrong, you don't wanna find out that you forgot to hook that back up. All right, so tip number eight, uh, still on the topics of alarms in your control panel, it's highly recommended that you test your alarm from time to time, and most of them just have a push to test. Uh, testing that alarm from time to time, similar to testing the fire, uh, I don't know, smoke detectors. I guess there are smoke and fire detectors nowadays is most common, but anyhow, um, you know, you push the button to test and it's the same idea with, uh, with these control panels. It's just a good idea to make sure that the alarm, more importantly, the horn, the alarm horn is working. Um, some of them, when you push the test button, it's also gonna light up the light to verify that your light's working. Uh, so depending on your situation and whether the sound or the light is more important, that's what you're looking for to make sure it's gonna work, that you're gonna know when you've got a problem. That way you can get it addressed quicker um, and hopefully save some money as opposed to wait until we have a big problem. All right, so working our way down the list here, tip number nine. So an important tip here and something that often gets overlooked, especially for you homeowners who do these projects on your own, uh, if you're replacing a control box, installing a control box, make sure that your incoming power, the conduit front, or not your incoming power, sorry, I misspoke. Make sure that your uh, power going to the pump is actually, you know, that you're gonna have a conduit that's stubbed up into your box here. You wanna make sure you're sealing that conduit off properly. You wanna prevent any sewer gases uh, from getting up into this box because the vapors and the gases are gonna cause serious corrosion in here and all the components are gonna fail in short order. If you've got a more advanced or more expensive control box with a PLC or some sort of a programmable logic type controller, um, that condensation, the vapors and everything is just gonna wreak heck on the circuitry and it's not gonna last and you know that's easily thousand dollars out the door so it's just a good idea to have proper conduit sealing you know uh, something like duct seal or some other electrically approved uh, conduit seal is going to really help to protect this piece of equipment so keep that in mind all right so here we are tip number 10 tip number 10 involves auxiliary alarm contacts Many, many, many panels today either offer or by default have auxiliary alarm contacts. And basically what those are is they're a set of points that you can hook a alarm to, a remote alarm, and you could hook up a light, a speaker, or even some auxiliary alarm system. Um, heck, you, some of these you can actually even tie into your home security system to where you can be notified, uh, whether it be remotely, so if your septic system is 200 yards away from your house for whatever reason, well, it might make sense to have a, a, a remote alarm a little bit closer to the house so that if something's going wrong, you know, it's not way too late before you finally catch on to it. So the auxiliary alarm contacts are, that's what they're used for. And I don't know that very many people that could take advantage of those are aware that that's a technology that's pretty commonplace. Um, 
and they can definitely be useful. I mean, it can put you in a situation where if you've got a larger home, uh, you could have your control box outside and have an auxiliary alarm inside in the basement or something. That way, you know, you've just got that extra level of security to respond to problems quicker because it's always, always, always the case that quicker is better when it involves repairing anything about your septic or water system or generally the longer you let it go the more it's going to cost you um, so that is that tip moving on all right and here we are with our final tip our bonus tip if you want to call it that but this tip is a big one and i cannot emphasize this enough so generally speaking pump control boxes offer you a few options when it comes to bringing power to the control box and uh, this pot this box in particular can be provided with one or two circuits uh, it's just a simplex box and so you can actually separate the control circuits from the circuit that powers the pump directly and the biggest level of protection that you're getting there is that um, if your pump for some reason was to trip the breaker, whether it had a short to ground, seal failure, something along those lines, uh, if you're running on one single circuit, well, your alarm is also on that circuit and you would definitely not get notified if the, if their alarm is not getting power because the pump tripped the breaker. So hopefully you can see there, you kind of would have a cascading failure effect that would just be very detrimental. And I understand there are situations where you just cannot run two circuits, but in any situation that it is possible, try to run separate circuits for your controls and each pump absolutely gonna never regret doing that because you're just gonna have such a better quality system simply because you know your alarm's gonna work and if you're having other problems it makes it easier to troubleshoot as well so it's not just simply that the alarm is gonna work there's some other benefits as well so keep that in mind I highly recommend running as many circuits as you can for any given any given control panel that gives you the option to choose so I hope you enjoyed those control panel tips. Uh, if you are looking for a control panel, we carry a number of great brands and offer a lot of custom customization and uh, a lot of flexibility with our panels, different types of enclosures, different applications. Feel free to give us a call. We're happy to give you a custom panel, something off the shelf. Chances are we've got something good that's gonna work for you. Um, so feel free to get a hold of us if you need some help. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great content and we will catch you next time.